Hello and welcome to Rajya Sabha TV's coverage of the FIFA World Cup. I'm your host Frank Rausen Pereira and with me in the studios Nilanjan Datta, senior sports journalist and Jyotian Bharat, former uh, national player of course. Uh, no football matches today but there is so much still to talk about, lots of football that we can talk about here in our studio and start our build up to the semi-finals itself. Uh, Jyoti? Semi-finals are just around the corner, just a day's wait. Yeah, very excited. I can't wait for tomorrow, actually. Um, it's, it's a very interesting lineup. One side being, you know, a clash of heavyweights and the other side being a clash of the underdogs. Um, so, can't wait to see actually who's <laughs> going to get through. Nirajan? Very hard to take a pick, in fact. I means among the four teams, if you rack, means... Pinch your brain, scratch your brains. Whom do you favor or whom do you support? What's a football match if you cannot take a side? So maybe half time you will be forced to switch means uh, sides from one side to the other. Oh, I'm not supporting France. I'm going for Belgium now. I don't know. It's very confusing. <laughs> okay, it's very confusing. No favorites as of now is what the panelists are saying. But let's go across first to Tina Jai and see what she has in store for us from the stat zone. Thank you, Frank. Welcome to the Stat Zone. I'm Tina Jha. So it's now down to just four teams at this World Cup. Two of them have won the trophy once each, while the other two have never won the World Cup and they now have the chance to create history. So the four teams in contention are France, Belgium, England and Croatia. France and Belgium will play the first semi-final, while England and Croatia go on to play the second. Talking about France first, the team ranked seventh in the world has played in the World Cup 15 times, including the current championship. Their first time at the World Cup was back in 1930 and their best performance came in 1998 when they emerged champions after defeating Brazil 3-0 in the final. France will play Belgium in the semi-final. Ranked third in the world at the moment, the current Belgian team has a lot riding on its shoulders. A Belgian team has never reached the finals and made just one semi-final appearance. Their best performance is fourth place that came in 1986 when they lost to Argentina 2-0 in the semi-final. England's 15th appearance at the World Cup has all the makings of being historic. The three Lions have made it to the semi-finals after 28 years. They last won the World Cup in 1966, defeating Germany 4-2. And if the fans' chant is to be believed, then it is coming home. England will play Croatia, who burst onto the world stage in 1998 and did their best that year, getting the third place. They lost to France in the semi-finals 2-1. They have played every World Cup since then, except the 2010 edition. For the moment, that's it from me from the Stanzo. Thank you, Tina. Let's talk about the four semi-finalists now, team by team. Jyoti, France. Happy with the way France has played thus far in the tournament and can they replicate their success of 1998? They've been consistent, I think, uh, from the first game on. I think they were a bit shaky nerve-wise uh, heading in their first game. But since then, they've looked uh, quite comfortable on the field. Uh, they've never been in a situation where I felt, oh, they might, they might lose this. You know, they've always uh, looked like they were going to win at the end of the day. Uh, they are the favourites, I think, looking at the four teams right now to go on and win this. Um, but they have won it before in 98. To me, I'd like to see a team that's never won it win it. <laughs> what about you, Dilajan? Do you want to see a new team lifting the World Cup this time around? And also a word on France itself. Do you believe that this French team is as good as the team that lifted the World Cup for the first time for France in 1998? Um, two parts of the question. The first part, obvious, why not? Because this World Cup will be remembered as uh, the World Cup of the underdogs. And if that's true, then uh, let a new team uh, emerge as a champion. The evolution of football suggests there are many powerful in footballing nations now, apart from those big traditional ones. No and problem. there's a 50-50 chance that a new team exactly. can win. So, um, uh, either of Belgium or Croatia um, uh, goes on to win. No complaints. I'd be cheering for them, in fact. France 1998 had big names, uh, but uh, they were big names. Uh, this team is a young team. So, that stature of big names, where you can attain a big name, this team has not reached such a level as yet. Uh, so, maybe 
if they win the World Cup, they will be becoming more household names as Zidane was, Desail was, Thierry Henry was, uh, Deshaw, the captain, the captain of that squad at that time. Pires. Uh, huh? Pardon? Robert, Robert Pires, yes. absolutely. Uh, Fabian Barthez, uh, Laurent Blanc. So they had won the World Cup. Uh, this French side can win the World Cup. I believe the balance and the depth of the French side makes them the favourites among these four teams who are in the semi-finals. Talking about the four teams, let's talk about the other team. The, the French are going to, of course, face the Belgians. Uh, your thoughts on Belgium, uh, Jyoti? Uh, to me, they're the most exciting team, team in the top four. The you know, team. the way they play, their, their link-up play, it's, it's really nice to watch. They obviously have been a side that's been playing together right from the youth level, you know. Through the ranks, they've been together and you can see that in the field. The way they combine, it's, it's years and years of them playing together. Um, they're exciting to watch and I feel that they do have it in them to beat this French team. But they'll have to really bring their A game because you, we know France are a strong team. They're physically strong, you know, you've got people like Pogba and, and Mbappe who are so quick. Uh, but Belgium can match them with a team performance on the day. Team performance, they can match them. What, what about player to player? Can the Belgians match the French? Uh, maybe yes, maybe no. But uh, in individual, won't be able to, I believe so, script the semi-final and the final. Because we don't have a Diego Maradona or a Ronaldo or even a Zidane out here. Belgium will score, but can they defend? Their defence has been a bit susceptible and uh, against this French squad which where the midfield and the striking zone is equally balanced, also with the defence, uh, that would be quite a task for them. In all the matches, they have been conceding goals. So that's, that's one of the big areas where they need to take care because this French side will be coming big at them hard at them and the game manship, not the game manship, the game management of the French team has impressed me like anything. They know how to control and regulate the specific quarters of a match, when to press. They are a young team but they are playing very mature very football, mature aren't they? Football, very matured football. They are not means, means not don daunted by the task which they have up their hand. Someone who is facing them and look at the names, they went past Lionel Messi and Argentina. That, that was quite a match for them. There were spells maybe when Argentina took a 2-1 lead. They pressed on the accelerator, they were 4-3 up. Uh, Belgium will score, they need to defend well for me. <laughs> All right. The defence is susceptible is what Nilanjan is saying as far as the Belgians are concerned, they are going to score. Let's look at the other side or the other, uh, other side of the draw, of course, where uh, England and Croatia have made it to the semi-finals. The road to the semi-finals as far as uh, England are concerned, uh, was it easy? Was it smooth, do you think? Um... Well, people keep saying, you know, they got the easier side of the group. But at the World Cup, I think there is no easy side uh, or easy opponent. You know, everyone at the World Cup is, is wants to win and it's hard. So, although they played Sweden, um, you know, Sweden, we, we can't say Sweden was a weak team by any standard. So, England beating them was, was a, a good achievement. The way they beat them, well, it was comfortable, not great to watch. They haven't been a team that's, you know, been like, wow, they're playing such amazing football. But they've been getting the job done. Um, they're a side who, you know, going up against Croatia will have to bring a lot of maturity to that game, a young side. Uh, but they, they have the, um, they do have the quality in them to give Croatia a run for the money. England, is it coming home? <laughs> It will go to a home which home no one knows <laughs> <laughs> and only on the uh, night of the 15th uh, the victorious team uh, supporters will be chanting it will be coming home. Well, uh, England um, have been playing to their strengths, uh, means that's the biggest advantage. The team I feel has been built as per the strength of the players. The system has been created for the players. The players did not go and fit into the system like the previous English squads have been doing. and. Uh, aerial threat and set pieces. When you go into set pieces, what you need is big players who can head, good spot jumps, means the presence out there and the delivery. All of that, that is perfect. People are trying to guess which side the players would be running. The deliveries have been perfect and mind you, each and every time they have got a free kick in and around the box or a corner kick, the rival teams have panicked. To shut them out, you cannot concede anything in the zone or maybe a corner kick. If you can do that, 
Croatia has the advantage. But if not, the Croatian defence has conceded of set pieces, even in the uh, match against Russia, England will be running away with the game. Let's talk about Croatia now. And Croatia's best performance so far in the World Cup has been a semi-final. And this team has managed to achieve that. Can this team go further? I'm sure they can. I mean, we know they've got the firepower. We know they've got a great midfield. It's just the last two games, they, we haven't really been... They haven't been dominant in the way that they were in the group stages. Um, but I feel on the day, if, you know, their midfield fires and their, and their strike line is, you know, on point, they are a side that's very hard to beat. Um, they've got a good defence as well. So, it's an all-round team. It's a very holistic team. Um, they've got experience and they've got youth. Um, that could be that could be something that could play in their favour when they go up against England. Croatia, mm, tired legs. Do you think also, Lilanjan? Is uh, that a problem? Could that uh, be a problem because I, I two was, long games? I was coming to them because at this stage where you have played so many matches in a span of means every match is in a span of maybe 72 hours. Recovery of the players, obvious, uh, is a huge factor. But having said that, uh, the medical staff of each and every team are exceptionally equipped. Means there's a huge medical team which is along with all the teams. Maybe 7, 8, 10, 11, 12 doctors, physios, messios, each one going out there. These are professional players, but yeah, at the back of the mind, uh, it plays on the mental side rather than more on the physical side. Two matches, despite all the start, the dominance, the promise, we have been stretched to the tiebreaker, to the penalty shootout. That can play a mind in the play a part in the minds of the Croatians, and England will also be trying to maybe play those mental games if possible. They've also had long, uh, you know, club seasons as well, so that could also be a factor, isn't it? Well, that that that's uh, that's the same for each and every it, player. It is, it is. Uh, that's yeah. the same for, you cannot blame, oh, I had a club season, the others didn't, everyone. And these professional players are fit enough. Oh, okay. Uh. It, that shouldn't be a concern, is what Nilanjan <laughs> is suggesting, of course. Uh, let's move on now and talk about something else. We've taken a look at the four semi-finalists. Let's not forget Russia 2018 was the international swan song for some huge names, four of them to be precise, like the four semi-finalists. Argentina's Javier Mascherano, Spain's Andreas Iniesta, Mexico's Rafael Marquez and Japan's Keisuke Honda have all announced their retirement from international football after their teams bowed out of the competition. Let's take a look at what each one of them said. Javier Mascherano said, It's time to say goodbye. I hope in the future these boys can achieve something. Let's take a look now at what Andreas Iniesta said. Everything has a beginning and an end. Sometimes not all farewells are as you expect as you wish. Rafael Marquez, probably the most experienced of the lot, said, For now, I think I will enjoy some free time. My future will surely be working in football. And finally, on our screens, of course, we have uh, Keisuke Honda, the Japanese, who said that we have a lot of good young players. Now it's their turn to write the history of Japanese football. Four names, uh, calling it a day, hanging up their boots as far as football is concerned. Will we miss these four stars, Jyoti? Definitely. Always, always sad to see, you know, such great names bow out. Um, uh, you know, for every, every player in football who's, who's made a mark for themselves leaves behind a legacy. And with the junior players of their squads, you know, of their club squads, of their national squads, they learn so much from these players and and you, they do lead by example and seeing them you know leave it's always sad but definitely the game is much richer such is life Nilanjan <laughs> Javier Mascherano has you know dedicated his entire life to Argentina and football uh, made his World Cup debut on the 10th of June 2006 20 appearances as far as the World Cup is concerned he's won 12 matches drawn four lost four the final game was for Argentina on the 30th of June 2018, where Argentina lost to France 3-4. He'll be 
a big loss for the Argentinian side, isn't it? Well, every good thing comes to an end. Uh, we need to look at it from that angle. Um, loss, yeah. Uh, I only hope he is not a loss for Argentinian football because he needs to continue, give his share, his expertise, groom younger players. What that batch of Messi, Saviola, Tevez, Riquelme, Pryor, Walter Samuel achieved, they came through a youth system. And I have been a huge fan of Argentinian football purely because of Diego Maradona. If you look at the structure of under-20, under-17, Argentina used to be a very potent force. At this present moment, they are not in world football. Maybe Javier needs to go there, look at the youth system, what um, uh, earlier used to be, and again, rejuvenate them and resurrect Argentinian youth football. There's a huge, huge vacuum in the youth structure in the country in Argentina. Let's talk about the other player now, Andreas Iniesta, uh, part of the golden era of Spanish football. He too has hung up his boots. Uh, the World Cup debut on the 23rd of June 2006. 14 appearances for Spain in the World Cup. Won eight, drawn three, lost three. Final game, of course, was on the 1st of July, where uh, Spain lost on penalties to Russia. Your thoughts on Andreas Iniesta and uh, the legacy that he has left behind? You know, fantastic player. You know, when the whole Spanish tiki taka, I feel. He, it was all around him. He was always the fulcrum of, of those little passes. Uh, great vision, you know, on the field. Uh, just a fantastic player, fantastic person off the field. A very humble person. Um, they, they'll miss him, for sure, because this man is... You don't come across in Iniesta very often uh, in football. And he was special to Spain, and they built their football around him. And with, without him, I feel, you know, they have to start from scratch, rebuild a team, rebuild a person right in the middle there who's going to be their fulcrum. You know, since you love Asian football, Lilanjan, I'm going to talk to you about the Japanese player. Keisuke Honda made his World Cup debut on the 14th of June 2010. 11 games he has played in the World Cup, won three, drawn three, lost five. Final game was on the 2nd of July 2018, where his team lost to Belgium 2-3. He has contributed immensely to Japanese football, hasn't he, Honda? Asian football, world football, um, I have um, all my Japanese friends. He's a big, big icon in Japan. Everyone looks up to him. And I am a bit surprised with Honda's decision because the um, uh, AFC Asian Cup, UA 2017, is around the corner. It's in the month of January 5th, it's kicking off. Japan would be one of the most potent forces out there. I would have thought Japan, uh, Honda stayed back till the Asian Cup and maybe then announced his retirement. Uh, would have wanted to see him play a bit more in the um, uh, World Cup this time, but obviously Japan did well without him. The writing was on the wall. I like what he said. The new generation. We have of... a lot of good young players. Now it's their turn to write the history of that, Japanese that, That's football. the greatness of great players. You do not want to hang around and prolong your time for the just sake of prolonging it. I am pe speaking purely from a fan's perspective. I have wanted him to would have wanted him to continue to the Asian Cup, but he knows I am not required anymore. That's the greatness of a great player. Indeed, you need to is. know when to call it quits. Let's talk about the fossil of uh, Mexican football. Rafael Marquez, World Cup <laughs> debut in 2002. June 3rd, World Cup appearances, 20 games, won eight, drawn four, lost eight. What a legacy he leaves behind, Jyoti. You know, I can't imagine the Mexican team without him because he's been there almost since I started properly following football. Uh, he is he's a legend, you know, in the Mexican circuit. And, um, I, you know, he's been around for so long. But I think, as Nilanjan said, it's always, that is a time, you know, when you know that the team, uh, you know, they've got young players, they've got players who are coming up, and you have to sort of bow out and leave space for them. And he's a, he's a great player, and he will go down in Mexican history, of course. Marquez probably reminds us of Lothar Matthias. <laughs> similar kind of player, similar kind of legacy that they leave behind as well, yes, Nilanjan. Lothar Matthias, yeah. Yeah, Marquez's <laughs> contribution to Mexican football means uh, the new generation has obviously learnt a lot from him. Such players need to be, means you'd be enjoying his time off the field, what he said. They need to be drawn and involved in the Mexican football, means in the football in and around this region. That would mean, make the Mexican football much more richer. He says, my future will surely be working in football, so looks like he could be taking up a coaching job sometime soon. That's Let's true. hope he does that and continues, you know, his legacy as far as a coach is concerned. 
Let's also talk about some of the players, of course, who are not retired. They still have a few more uh, matches certainly left in them. But will they play another World Cup? Lionel Messi, uh, Jyoti. I think he has another World Cup in him. I don't. I feel that I, there is something there for Messi to prove at this at a World Cup, and I think. But at what cost? <laughs> <laughs> I would. I I hope he plays another World Cup. London, Ronaldo. Last World Cup, or do you think he's no, no, got he will, play. he will play provided both Argentina and Portugal qualify for the next World Cup in Qatar? I believe both should be there because the fitness levels of and awareness levels of these generation of players is much more than what a Diego Maradona had in the 80s. They are very disciplined, know what but to eat. But four years is a long train. time, there's a lot but that can I, happen I, in four I years. I personally see them playing club football for the next four years. It's the motivation that you qualify to the World Cup around two and a half years, means one and a half year prior to the kickoff of the World Cup. That's when you need to make the call, I'll be there, I won't be there. Without Messi, it's hard to imagine an Argentine team because he made them qualify. And even without Ronaldo, it's hard to means speak about a Portugal team because I don't see anyone taking up the position out there. If I'm allowed to speak again, speaking a, a, a lot more. Uh, both of them are forwards. And forwards, longevity longevity of a striker or a midfielder in and around that region with that creativity is much more than a defender. Sure. So maybe they should be there. I want them to be there. Okay, you want them to be there. Even Jyoti thinks that they are going to be there for the next World Cup. All you LM10 and CR7 fans, all is not lost. Maybe you will see CR7 and LM10 in the next World Cup as well. On that note, we'll slip into a short break. Now on the other side, we have much more lined up for you. We're going to talk more about football. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. Welcome back. Uh, you're watching the FIFA World Cup coverage on Rajya Sabha Television. I'm Frank Rausen Pereira. I'm going to give you some more names now other than mine. Some great, great ones, of course. Those who have won the Golden Boot in years, or rather World Cups prior to this. Let's talk about 2014. First, I'm going to pick your brains as well. Who won the Golden Boot in 2014? I believe so. Hamis Rodriguez. How many goals? How many goals did he score? Uh, guess. Half a dozen. Six. Six is what he scored. So, let's look at the other player now in 2010. Jyoti, who won the Golden Boot in 2010? Any guesses? Um, I think, think Thomas Muller. Yeah. yeah, it was Thomas Muller. How many goals? Uh, I'd say seven, eight? Five. Oh. And who was it the year prior to that, Nilanja? Another German Miroslav Klose. Very good. <laughs> Nilanja's got an impressive memory, I must say. And 2002, Jyoti. Oh, wow. Um, Brazilian, Brazilian. Ronaldo. <laughs> yeah. It was Ronaldo with uh, eight goals. And uh, so let's talk about some of the iconic players as far as Golden Boot winners are concerned. Uh, Nilanja? Who was the most iconic for you, do you think, as far as the Golden Boot winner? Uh, as far as I have watched, uh, Ronaldo mm. has to be the Golden Boot winner among uh, the World Cups I have been watching. But I have a problem with the Golden Boot winner. Why only a one who's scoring the goals? Why is not there a midfielder or a defender? You have a Golden Glove, okay, that's understandable. Why can't you have a best player of the World Cup? Because the best player of the World Cup is not getting any award like an the Golden Glove or the Golden Boot. He's actually someone else. The first major World Cup I watched, Gary Lineker took away the Golden Boot. Diego Maradona won the World Cup. 
From then on, I had the problem, why is my idol not getting the best player or the golden boot? Maybe it can be twisted a bit more or a new award coming in. I have a problem with that. Okay, you have a problem with that. Jyoti, do you also have a similar problem? Do you think you should have a player of the tournament maybe instead of a golden boot and a golden glove? Yeah, I think that like an M MVP would be a lot more, would make more sense. True. Uh, you know, looking at, because football is not just about the guy who's scoring the goal. The people setting it up for him are equally, if not more important. So, definitely there should be something slightly more, uh, you know, encouraging for everyone on the team. You know, uh, I have a difficult question for you, Nilanjan, <laughs> since you're the oldest of the lot here. <laughs> so, let's see if you can get that right. Who was the first Golden Boots winner? Don't remember. 1930, eight goals. Guillermo Stabil was the Golden Boot winner way back in 1930. Let's, I'm not going to pick your brain, uh, <laughs> uh, Jyoti, but let's talk about someone who has not won the Golden Boot. The most prolific striker in international football. Pele has never won a Golden Boot at all. Are you surprised about that? That is surprising, yeah. That is surprising. Nilanjan, why do, you think, why do you think Pele hasn't won a uh, Others won the scored goal. the goals, he set up the goals. <laughs> it's as simple as that. But that, that's the thing. Why means Pele is Pele, he's the king of football. But he has not got an award from FIFA or during the World Cup. Not that it matters, but why not? He's the most, he has been the most valuable player as MVP. Jyoti rightly picked up the term in many a World Cup. Why? Cristiano uh, Maradona, I beg Maradona? Diego Maradona 86. has never won a Golden Boot. He, he won the World Cup on his own at that exalted height of Mexico. Mm. <laughs> it was Gary, Gary Lineker, Lineker who I won the Golden that. Boot in that particular World Cup. I think seven or eight goals is what he scored. Let's talk about the present Golden Boot. Harry Kane, another Englishman, probably going to lift that uh, trophy? At, that, at the more surface, it seems yes. But again, he has not been the best player of the World Cup. There have been better performances from Kane. Not taking away anything from Harry Kane because some of the goals, most of the goals have come in from set pieces. You need to put them in. But is he the best player is the big question. And uh, Jyoti, who has, the, who has been the best player of this tournament for you? Um, if I had to pick the best player, I, firstly, I am very much for a playmaker or a defender. I feel you know, they're very important, even a goalkeeper. So I'm not so, so uh, you know, enamoured by strikers. Uh, so I think the best... It's, play... <laughs> it's rather strange coming from a striker, but well, I yeah, we'll I think, I think, yeah, because being a striker, I realise that it's just the icing on the cake, you know, because I know when I score a goal, I don't feel like I've done such a big... I actually look at, you know, who's given me that great pass or who's built up that entire play, link play that's got the ball to me in such a good area. So for me, I think it would be someone like uh, De Bruyne or someone who's creating, you know, the, the, the goals for Belgium or even um, uh, someone like Gordon, as I said, in defence. They are very important. Gordon is her pick as far as defenders are concerned. Who's your pick? Uh? It's hard Nilanjan. to take a pick uh, who's no, the best. Who do you think was the best defender this time Diego around? Gordon. Diego. Diego Gordon. Without any doubt. It's unfortunate his team went off, but such is life again. Uh, one split second mistake sees your team out. That's the life of a defender. You may, you may miss three to four open chances, your team still swings. That's the life of a striker. Final thoughts uh, on your best goalkeeper of the, goal, uh, of the tournament thus far, Jyoti? Um... I think Courtois has really played well. I think he's, uh, especially in the last game, he's really impressed me. I think he's someone who's slightly underrated, I feel. Um, and picking from the goalkeepers who are still in the, in the tournament, uh, Courtois, to me, has been really good. All right, OK. I think I picked your brains enough for today. Thank you, Nilanjan and Jyoti, for joining uh, me on the programme and sharing your perspectives. That's it on this telecast. But we'll be back same time tomorrow. So do stay tuned and watch us then as well. That's it from us. See you again tomorrow.